Bonjour à tous. Donc aujourd'hui, c'est un plaisir d'accueillir Malik Galab, qui va nous présenter euh, un séminaire Integrative Heterogeneous AI, Integrated of Task and Motion Planning. J'en dirai pas plus sur le contenu, parce que bien sûr, nous aurons euh, une heure pour écouter euh, Malik, mais juste quelques mots. Euh, beaucoup connaissent euh, Malig, mais peut-être pas tout le monde. Euh, Malig est connu euh, sous plusieurs aspects. Euh, une quarantaine d'années de, de recherche intensive euh, dans ces domaines de l'intelligence artificielle et de la robotique. Euh, et puis, euh, en parallèle avec ces recherches, un certain nombre d'activités euh, de responsabilité, qu'on appelle responsabilité collective, de, de, de direction, euh, de programme de laboratoire. Alors, j'en ai retenu que quelques-unes. Euh, directeur du LAS, je crois que c'est peut-être comme ça que nous, beaucoup de Toulousains que te connaissent le plus. Donc, euh, alors, les, les, les années, je vais dire, c'est dans les années 2000, mais je préfère regarder mon, mon pense-bête pour ne pas me tromper. 2003, euh, voilà, 2003-2007, voilà. Euh, mais euh, bien avant cela, euh, au début des années 90, euh, directeur d'un programme de recherche collaboratif, ce qu'on appelle les groupements de recherche au CNRS, donc sur, euh, déjà sur l'intelligence artificielle. Alors les, les, les spécialistes qui ont suivi, mais tu en diras peut-être un mot, qui ont suivi le, le, le sujet de, depuis le départ, euh, bon, savent qu'il y a eu des, un peu des hauts et des bas, on est dans une période euh, de renouveau euh, très fort, euh, avec en particulier, et euh, je vais faire un petit saut, euh, pour arriver à ta... Non, je vais peut-être pas aller tout de suite à ta responsabilité actuelle. Entre, entre tout ça, tu as aussi euh, pris une responsabilité importante à l'INRIA, donc la de recherche d'informatique automatique, dont tu étais le directeur scientifique pendant euh, quatre années, juste après ta, ta direction du, du LAS, donc euh, euh, dans les années 2007-2010. Et euh, actuellement, tu as été appelé par euh, les collègues de l'Université de Toulouse pour euh, piloter, pour présider euh, le steering committee euh, de ce nouveau projet euh, ANITI, euh, donc sur euh, l'intelligence artificielle, donc euh, vous savez tous que Toulouse fait partie des, des quatre sites, des quatre projets qui ont été sélectionnés par le jury international dans le, dans le courant de l'hiver et du printemps. Euh, C'est un projet qui démarre euh, très fort, dans lequel euh, l'IRT est impliqué, euh, dans lequel euh, évidemment tous nos collègues euh, du, sur le sujet sont, euh, sont impliqués. Beaucoup d'industriels aussi euh, ont manifesté un intérêt très fort et donc euh, Malik est là pour euh, coordonner, piloter euh, cette activité. Mais euh, ce matin, nous allons surtout t'écouter pour euh, des résultats scientifiques menés, je vais nous le dire un petit peu, mais dans ton équipe de recherche, euh, entre autres. Voilà, tu as la parole, Malik. Thank you, thank you, Bertrand, for this nice introduction. Uh, I was asked to make this, this talk in English. If there is uh, anyone not comfortable with this option, I can switch uh, to French and keep my slides in English. Is it okay for everyone? All right. Uh, so, uh, Th thanks again. I'm very pleased to contribute to this uh, seminar. Um, uh, I'll be talking about uh, planning. I understand that planning is not at the focus of uh, this institute, although it is relevant to a number of uh, your projects, several of your projects. Uh, may use uh, uh, planning and uh, you have a strong interest in uh, space application, in aeronautics, in autonomous systems where planning can also be uh, uh, relevant. Uh, I was not expecting specialists of, uh, of planning in the audience, but I see several here, so probably a uh, few things will uh, not be very much uh, of uh, uh, n not much new things for, for them. This is more uh, a survey and I'll put the focus on integration issue. I know that your institute has a strong interest in integration because you are dealing with concrete uh, industrial problems where integration is essential. Uh, the, the entire things start with the, uh, the Descartes view of an analyzing in depth and getting uh, with restrictive hypothesis, digging new facts and new knowledge. This is how science advances, and this has uh, been summarized by uh, Jean-Marc Lévy Leblanc with uh, uh, this saying. So, uh, but uh, we know also that although this method has produced wonderful results, including in AI, uh, it is no longer sufficient because real world problems are, appear more to be more complex. And we see that the main scientific challenges as well as application challenges lie at the coupling of heterogeneous phenomena. This is true in all areas of science and engineering and including in AI. So I'll, I would like to illustrate a few aspects of integrative AI, but what is integrative AI? Um, the easiest thing for me is to answer it by saying how I see AI. 
So AI uh, is multidisciplinary research fields that uh, draw and builds on top of several fields. It's not an artifact or, or, or an object that you, could put, you can put uh, somewhere. It's a, a research field whose purpose is the mechanization of tasks. What tasks? This is a very old story that goes back about the mechanization of mathematics at, le at least to the 16th and 17th century by the work of Leibniz about a mechanical me method for reasoning and assessing truths and after that in the 17th century to Boole, to uh, Givens who built uh, a device for making mechanical proofs to Hilbert and Frege and uh, in the recent 20th centuries we moved to computational mechanization of tasks. And th this purpose is addressed by designing computational models of how to achieve a task, finding effective implementation of these models in terms of software and hardware, and experimenting in order to see how far we have been uh, doing and how good we have been doing in, uh, in uh, mechanizing this task. And of course, we try also to develop useful applications. So having said that, I have to explain what are the tasks? You certainly are, have in mind and are aware of the uh, imitation game uh, proposed by Alan Turing. Uh, you know this kind of task on which AI has uh, made substantial contribution in the past. Uh, here is a task that you may not be familiar with. Uh, this crow has uh, a metallic rod and he's interested in some food at the bottom of uh, this container. But the, the, uh, the, the rod is not the appropriate tool. He figures out that the appropriate tool should be a, 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 a hook in order to pick up the food. So basically, he tried to come up with a plan to, to, to have the appropriate tool in order to, to do the appropriate job of getting the, the food. So this crow has been born in captivity and raised in captivity. He never saw someone doing this. This is something that he comes up with giving his interest in getting the food. So at some point, he's happy with the hook and he achieves the task. So this is a quite different task from the first two that I mentioned. This is uh, a task that I would refer to as a heterogeneous task. So an intuitive distinction between homogeneous and heterogeneous task, this is a homogeneous task. This is a homogeneous task from the viewpoint view of the AI that's behind. Uh, this theorem prover, Koch, uh, more than 20 years of work at INRIA is, uh, refers to homogeneous tasks for doing mathematics. Translation systems are homogeneous tasks. Uh, diagnosis systems with a bias uh, net as complex as this one is homogeneous task. And a pick-and-place robot in manufacturing performs more or less homogeneous tasks if uh, you engineer out the environment. Heterogeneous task. Of course, this is a highly heterogeneous task. I'll try to explain a bit why. Uh, but I believe that this is also a heterogeneous task. You, you, are, you may be aware of this uh, TV game, Geopardy, that was uh, won by, uh, by IBM Watson in 2011. And uh, a versatile robot like this one doing a complex assembly uh, task is performing something highly heterogeneous. So this is an intuitive distinction between homogeneous and heterogeneous task. So if we get into a bit more detail, uh, I would say that uh, homogeneous tasks uh, are addressable with a unified model and a unified approach. Whereas heterogeneous tasks require multiple cognitive functions, multiple computational representations and algorithms. And you have to do the integration. Uh, the fact that the distinction between homogeneous and heterogeneous does not necessarily map into a distinction between abstract and embodied task. Embodied, that is a task that is achieved uh, by a physical machine in the physical world. However, most embodied tasks are heterogeneous, not all of them. You, you may have a vacuum cleaner at home, and vacuum cleaner is doing something very homogeneous. It doesn't require uh, multiple cognitive functions and multiple uh, representations. Uh, so, if you would agree that AI is about the mechanization of tasks, then I would suggest that integrative AI is about the mechanization of heterogeneous tasks. This is my definition of what is integrative AI. You may uh, find others, but I, I, I prefer to start from the notion of tasks because it's clearer what you are trying to address. 
So, example of heterogeneous problems that are given by, uh, by heterogeneous uh, tasks. The integration of perception of and motion. If you compare um, an image uh, labeling or a recognition, artificial image labeling or recognition uh, system with what the human does, you make a very restrictive uh, assumptions about how we work. We integrate a lot of things and in particular perception and motion that had led in, in robotics to interesting problems such as visual servoing. The integration of planning and acting where in addition to perform your plan you have to achieve it and I contributed to a recent book on this topic full of uh, integrative uh, problems. The integration of signals and relation. This is a very interesting set of problems that, in my view, are not enough addressed in AI, uh, among which you have the anchoring and grounding problems. Uh, anchoring is to, pr to keep a, a mapping between data and relations about the same physical object. Uh, grounding is about a class of objects. So you, you have uh, some signals that come from your sensors, percepts uh, about what you perceive in various uh, ways, and you have some knowledge, some models uh, about the shape, the behavior, uh, the, the color of this object, and so on. And you keep what, what in the literature we call an anchor, which map these two into uh, uh, some relation. But this anchor is just a hypothesis. You have to keep tracking if the object changes and so on. You have to refine your relationship. You have to revise it over time. And these are uh, very hard, tough problems that, in my view, are not enough addressed in robotics and uh, have uh, a wide uh, set of applications. So, uh, in the remaining, I'll focus on the integrated uh, task and motion planning uh, and I'll try to de define what it is, uh, what are its ingredients, task planning, motion and manipulation planning, and how you model ten problems and a few things about how you solve them. So this is the outline of the rest of, of the talk. So planning. You, you have the easy and simple problem of plan ana analysis where the input is a network of task instances and the output are the properties, critical passes, critical tasks, and possibly uh, some uh, optimization that you can do. And you can solve that with the cl classical program evaluation and review techniques, the PERT techniques that are well known. This is uh, a solved set of issues. You have plan scheduling, where your input is a set of task instances and constraints, and the output is uh, an organization, a schedule with resource allocation. And you get this kind of diagram where you have a set of jobs and a set of machines, the colors here, and you have to organize them uh, according to some optimization criteria. And you have plan synthesis, where the, 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 the problem is to synthesize a plan. Your input are models of what is possible, what can be done, and uh, also of the world and the goal. And the output is an organized collection of action instances instances of these generic models in order to reach the goal. So basically, these three classes of problems, analysis is a problem of scheduling, which is a sub-problem of pr plan synthesis. In when, you, when we talk about planning in AI, this is the problem uh, that is of interest in to the uh, planning community in a broad sense. And uh, it, it can be applied to space, uh, of course, to robotics and autonomous systems, to activity deployment, uh, such as emergency rescue, for example, uh, to computer-aided design and manufacturing, to business process management, to animation, virtual reality, to games and serious games. The list of applications is quite wide. So, from now on, planning for me is plan synthesis. And plan synthesis is basically a coupling of two kinds of operations, simulation and search. Simulation of the possible effect of an action with a predictive model. You need a predictive model in order to, uh, uh, to guess what may happen. And the search over all possible organizations of feasible actions in order to meet a goal or to optimize a criteria. You have to combine these two set of operations into something that can be summarized in a schematic way uh, as follows. You start from some state, uh, you have a model of a possible action A that can, is feasible in this state, and you, you have a predicted state. But you can do other action, you can do B, C, and so on and you can move on from the, the next state, etc. And you would like to, to keep doing these simulations and search until you reach a goal. This is a very schematic view, and you will see that uh, it has to be uh, perceived in different ways because you have different types of actions 
with different knowledge representation, different predictive models, and then different algorithms and techniques can apply. The various forms of, uh, of planning are, for example, task planning, where you consider uh, actions as only at the abstract causal level. These are just uh, causal relations between conditions and effects. And you end up with a skeletal plan that may or may not be very helpful, which is a path in a state transition system to reach a goal. This is what I call uh, uh, task, task planning. And basically, the, the skeletal plan is what is schematized here. Uh, you have motion and manipulation planning, where uh, the, uh, uh, the, the your, your knowledge and data and, and models are kinematic trajectory in free space, control and dynamics along this trajectory, and you have the grasp, poses, forces, and contact relations in, in order to uh, find out how you can move and uh, grasp in order to perform your manipulation planning problems. You have perception planning, where you, 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 you solve issues such as the viewpoint selection, where should I put my sensors and how should I move in order to perform a modeling task or a recognition task. Your communication planning, in particular in human-robot interaction, what should I uh, present, what should I ask, what should I uh, interpret, and a number of uh, uh, elements in a communication uh, and make a plan out of it. Uh, in uh, uh, time, task and motion planning is about the integration of the first two. I will not be mentioning about the, 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 the last two, although they are very relevant in a number of things I mentioned. So here is uh, a simple instance of a time problem, task and motion planning problem. This is what I call fetch, process, and set. You have a, a set of objects here that you have to process here, for example, you have to clean them, to assemble them, to, to feel them, uh, a number of things, and then you have to set them in their goal position, and you have a robot uh, to do that. My examples uh, will all be uh, illustrated through robotics. So if I uh, present this problem, you can say, well, uh, I don't necessarily need planning. I can just come up with a script like this one. I can script out what is needed. And my script can, can say for each object to be processed, move uh, to the position where the object is reachable, grasp the object, move to the processing po positions, process the object, and so on. And this script, hopefully, will allow you to, to do the job. But it doesn't work. It doesn't work because when you have to grasp, you have to, to consider where you should grasp, what, how you should move things in order to grasp them. If uh, in this case or in that case, you, you may have a number of constraints to be uh, uh, ta taken care of that can make the script I, I mentioned completely useless. The, the constraints are cluttering constraints. You, you, you may need to move out a number of objects in order to access. You have accessibility constraints, a kinematic constraint where you should put the system in order to be able to access uh, dynamics constraints, uh, assembly constraints if you have to assemble desirability constraints, a number of, of constraints that needs to be taken into account for doing planning. And you have to integrate different representations of actions, in particular the, the two I'll be focusing on, uh, the uh, causal one and the, the uh, motion manipulation one, and you have to integrate different types of algorithm. So here is a taxonomy of uh, temp problems. The fetch process and set uh, is a quite generic problem for pick, place, and move, which has been studied in li literature, and the subclass of this one is navigation among movable objects. For example, in order to move from here to here, I have to push this sofa a, a bit. So this is navigation among movable ar uh, obstacles. You have the uh, ar uh, rearrangement of multiple objects. For example, sort out the green object here and the red one here. Uh, you have manipulation uh, problems, uh, and the subclass of that is dexterous, or particular case of that is dexterous manipulation, illustrated here. You have manipulation of non with non pronounceable actions, where you manipulate by pushing, for example, in order to be able to do something. You cannot grasp it in this position, because of the hand you cannot grasp it in this position, you have to push it. And you have the uh, structure assembly and construction, if your process here requires assembly, this is a subcase of it, such as stacking with dynamic issues, such as assembly, such as constructions. So uh, this is, let's say, uh, a map of the sequential case of fetch process and, and set. But you also have the concurrent case where you, you can have the human-robot interactions that require this kind of problems, multi-robot cooperation, dual arm, such as uh, uh, in this example where uh, your, your problem can, can be solved only by passing the object from one arm to, to the other. 
So a taxonomy of possible uh, time problems has to be, this taxonomy has to be refined, but in the remaining I'll focus on uh, this problem. So a naive approach to uh, do task and motion planning is to consider planning only at the abstract causal level and to leave motion at the execution level, solve motion manipulation problems only at uh, the execution. This doesn't work. Uh, it requires all your action to be feasible and weakly constraints environment because you may get into traps where your actions are, your motions and manipulations are no longer feasible and it can be highly inefficient and costly in retrials in the physical world, not in computing. So this is not good. And um, illustrated here, if you have to move this, ob this tree object from here to here, and if you start with the big yellow one, you will not be able to put uh, the other ob objects behind it because of reachability issues. Uh, you have other cases uh, illustrated for the reachability of this position to, to put it on a pile, and you, you guess what would happen if you start with the green instead of the red in this case. So basically, uh, this doesn't work. Uh, one uh, option is to do hierarchical decoupling of task planning from motion planning. This has been tried and uh, this is the major, uh, let's say, um, set of approaches uh, for integrating task and motion planning. So you have a task planner which finds a sequence of abstract actions without any metric parameters and motion planning, that motion manipulation that refine each abstract action into precise metric poses and motion. So uh, in, in the planning community, we have a property called downward refinement, which says that you can do this if this one is independent of this one. This is not the case. Uh, they are not independent. Uh, uh, the, the advantage is simple integration. The disadvantage is complexity and completeness because you end up doing a lot of backtrack and this is a very computationally uh, demanding uh, uh, task. So hierarchical decoupling is one option, but doesn't lead too far. Uh, and the integrated uh, task and motion planning is in particular required where you have a cluttered environment, where retrials are not practical, where you have the complexity of motion planning, where backtracking is very expensive and complex actions are often meaningless without metric parameters. You have to take them into account. So. Uh, this is a very active research topic in the planning community, the integration of task and motion planning. You have a number of specialized workshops, already large literature. We are preparing a survey. Uh, more than uh, two or three hundred uh, papers are available uh, that tackle several aspects. And But the state of the art, although very rich, is still missing a precise comparison and qualification, as well as uh, accepted and well-developed benchmark and a mapping between specific problems in the taxonomy I mentioned and uh, approaches. So this is uh, the a brief introduction about uh, and motivation about uh, how uh, and why you should integrate task and motion planning. So few words about task planning. Is uh, someone here uh, familiar with task planning? Few of you? Okay. Not that many. So uh, for those who are familiar, sorry if uh, this sounds too uh, easy and trivial, uh, but I'll, I'll put a recall, uh, a, re uh, a brief uh, uh, summary to for the others. So your representation of the, uh, of the word relies on a set of relations that w I call parameterized state variables. So this relation, you can think of it as a predicate, but it's e easier to think of it as uh, a parameterized state variable, is mapping from time. For, for, the, for, for example, this refers to where this object is from time and object to a position. And I require everything to, to be uh, over finite sets, such as to have a finite uh, uh, space. Uh, this is another uh, uh, parameterized state variable or predicate about uh, mapping from time and object to uh, the receptacles where the object can be put in, and, and so on. So you, you describe the world with these uh, uh, parameterized state variables or relations over finite set. And you describe your actions what is feasible by uh, just specifying the causal relationship between when and what. When this take action is feasible and what is its effect in the world. In terms of this relation, I would say that robot R, any robot R in this description, can take an object O in a position P when the robot is at some location, when uh, the object is at some position, and the position is reachable from the object, and the robot arm is free and what expre expresses in terms of these relations what would happen. 
with this kind of abst very abstract and in a way poor uh, set of models you can do a lot of things in terms of planning uh, and generate something like that uh, this would be a plan for my fetch process and store you move a robot r1 to location 3 you take from r1 object 5 at position 26 giving that position 26 is reachable from location 3 and so on and Hopefully, this may or may not work out because at this point, I didn't say how to move or how to take. I didn't get into this detail. I'm at the abstract level of task planning. Is everyone with me at this point? Okay. So, task planning generates these kind of things. So, the trivial case, uh, I have a state transition graph. Let's generate it explicitly. Once I have the state, generate, uh, uh, state transition graph uh, generated, I do search in the graph. And this is a solved problem. Searching a, a graph, we know how to, to do that. And this is what your uh, uh, navigation tools do all the time to tell you how, where to go from your home to uh, uh, some, some place. Unfortunately, this doesn't work. Even the very simple problem that I mentioned with five locations, 10 positions each, and 50 objects, your state space would be of this size. So. And if I put several robots, uh, it, it will be uh, s to the power three to, to for a couple of robots s s to the power three, ten to the power three hundred states. It's hopeless. You cannot do any planning with explicit state transition graph. It doesn't uh, simply make sense. So what you have to do is you generate part of your state transition along with planning. So you have a generative planning. In this case, deterministic. So basically, you know only a part of your state space out of the S, uh, 10 to the power 150 states, you would like to generate a few thousands, a uh, few, uh, let's say a million at most, and, and get your plan. And the state of the art can, can do that. Basically, the idea is to choose a search state in the known part of your uh, set of space, to choose a few promising actions, and all the problem is what are the promising actions, so what's the goal, and to generate successors with your simulation models of this state with the chosen actions. So this is the uh, generative deterministic uh, planning and it has made a lot of progress. Um, here I, I, I spoke only about states, but you can uh, work with time and uh, get something like this that we, we, we developed some uh, 20 years ago. This is the XTAT uh, planner where you end up with a plan as a set of actions and constraints that uh, some of them are concurrent and constraints between them and it is something quite flexible and this is the timeline time based planning that uh, was started here uh, in Toulouse, I mentioned in, in the, the 90s and was used with uh, very successfully in many other places. One of the uh, successful stories of planning is Deep Space One that used this kind of uh, uh, timeline planning uh, approach uh, to plan for uh, the uh, deep, deep Space One uh, system uh, for se 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 are several days, couple of couple of days uh, uh, autonomously. So a success story for automated planning with temporal uh, techniques, but you also have non-deterministic and probabilistic techniques where uh, your action may lead to several possible states and you uh, have models that predict all the possible outcomes of your states. Only one of them would happen, but you may have a probabilistic distribution and a reason on, on, on that. So the task planning uh, community has filled in all these uh, issues of straight transitions, temporal, non-deterministic, with a number of techniques that I'm not going to, to, to survey, uh, but the state of the art is very well advanced, and uh, in the simplest case, we can generate plans that have thousands of uh, uh, actions in the, 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 the most simple case. I contributed to uh, uh, the uh, standard textbook on, on this field with a couple co colleagues some, some years ago. I refer you to this uh, textbook if you'd like to, to know more. So this was uh, my, my brief introduction about task planning, another brief introduction about motion and manipulation planning, where I would like to uh, introduce the notion of configuration space and a few things about motion planning and motion planning and uh, manipulation planning. Here, the standard textbook is due to uh, Steve Laval, uh, planning algorithms by Ca at Cambridge University Press. Again, I refer you to this uh, book for more detail on motion and manipulation planning. It, it goes back to 2006, is I if I remember correctly, and other things have been published since, of course. So, uh, your input is the shape and the motion capabilities and constraints of the moving bodies. 
and you have also a description of the 3D space and obstacles. And you have an initial and goal configurations. And your output is to find a path in the free, free space from the initial to goal configuration, which meets the motion and kinematics Okay, the motion, kinematics, and dynamic constraints, and avoids non-obstacles. So th this is the uh, a simple uh, specification of the problem, input and the uh, required uh, output. So let's illustrate this in a 2D Euclidean space. Here, I have a simple robotics arm with just two degrees of freedom. You can change alpha and beta, and you have an obstacle here, and the, the problem is to go from A to B. So your actions are only changing alpha and beta. If you, if you need to plan, it's not in the Euclidean space that you can do planning because you do not act in this space. Your actions are in the space of alpha and beta. So I, I draw this space, which is called the configuration space, and I have to project these obstacles into this space, and the projection of this circle is this strange-shaped uh, uh, part that makes the two configuration A and B, non uh, no, uh, di disjoint. You cannot move from one to the other. And planning has to take place here. H here is another example, again in 2D, uh, with uh, two degrees of freedom, are two possible uh, changes in your configuration at uh, this rotation. And here, three obstacles and the projections of these three obstacles in, uh, uh, in this configuration space. Uh, uh, an uh, another uh, obstacles which are, are not aligned with, but wi with has a, a shape, and the projections of the three obstacles. These projections, if I had three degrees of freedom, for, for example, here, uh, I would not be able to draw them or uh, even to compute them, but of so a few, few cases. So basically, the configuration space uh, starts from the fact that your motion changes configuration variables. Uh, every motion changes your configuration variables, and you control that by uh, controlling your configuration variables. So your configuration space is uh, your vector of configuration variables, and usually it's part of R to the n. In the, two ex in the examples before, uh, this is simply the Cartesian product of uh, these two parts of the uh, real line. And the CF is the free configuration space away from the obstacles. So computing CF from kinematics and CAD models is very complex when n is greater than 2. Uh, if I had just a car with three degrees of freedom, uh, it would be very complex to illustrate how, uh, an, uh, w how the, uh, a car may park automatically, uh, given the obstacles around it. And, but testing whether a given configuration is in CF or whether two configuration can be, can be joined in CF is much easier. So instead of doing this m mapping of the obstacles uh, from C uh, in order to compute CF, we are re will be uh, relying on the fact that this is uh, a much easier task. So the uh, roadmap uh, method, probabilistic roadmap and variant, pre-compute a roadmap that capture the connectivity of CF and reuse this roadmap for answering motion space uh, queries. And the diffusion methods, instead of pre-computing a roadmap that can be used uh, se several times, they solve a specific motion search query by expanding a tree rooted at the query uh, initial and goal configurations. S l let me uh, br briefly pre present this and po possibly uh, skip th this one or just give you uh, a hint about how it works. So a roadmap is a randomly generated graph. A node is a configuration point in the free configuration space. So you have a set of, in, uh, a set of points in the free configuration space. And an edge is a feasible direct motion between two configurations. You don't have to move around obstacles. And the graph, th the basic property is this one. Your graph covers the configuration space when this property holds. There is a feasible motion in the configuration space if and only if there is a feasible path in the graph. If this property holds, then if you find a path in graph, you find a path in the configuration, in the configuration space because of, of these properties. So you transform motion planning into a graph search problem, and th this we know how to do very uh, uh, efficiently. So basically, here is how I it works. Um, th this is a planner that was also developed at, in, uh, at last in uh, the uh, 90s and uh, uh, with uh, Florent seated here uh, and uh, Jean-Paul Lemont and uh, Thierry Simon, we, 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 we started a company uh, called, uh, at that time called Kino that was uh, bought by uh, others uh, that relied on this uh, technology. It's still in business uh, and uh, uh, is doing fine as far as uh, uh, I know. 
So uh, the, here is how it works. You, 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 you take a, a random configuration. This is my configuration space. Uh, these are obstacles. You take a, a random configuration that's not within obstacles, and this ro random configuration covers in direct motion all this blue area. Any point in this area can be reached from this configuration. You take another configuration, it has already been covered, it's not of interest to me at this point. This configuration covers a new area, this configuration is already covered, this also, this covers a new area, and you keep expanding. This covers nothing here too, here too. Ah, this, ha this is an interesting configuration because it sees two configurations, so it allows to augment the connectivity of my graph, and I keep it at, at two edges. Uh, this extends the area, I keep it, I keep doing this. Here, I see two areas with this one, I connect, I connect them, and I keep doing this, and at some point, I'm happy, and I have a graph. And now, with this graph, I can do motion planning with the following uh, algorithm. So basically, you iterate until some termination condition. You take a random point in the configuration space and you test whether it is in the free space. If it is, then you test whether it already covers, it is already covered, if there is some other configurations that you can go to directly, uh, uh, then it's not of interest to, to you. If there is none, then you add it to the graph. Otherwise, if there is two configurations that are not already connected, but you can connect them through this new configuration, then you add this node and the two edges to the graph. And you keep doing this until your termination condition. And the termination condition relies on uh, probabilistic completeness property, which means that you are not complete, you, 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 you are not sure that you have the, the coverage property that I mentioned, but if I uh, say that k is a number of consecutive and successful samples of configurations in CF that are not added to, to G, that is, all, all configurations for which not, neither this configuration, uh, neither this uh, uh, close nor this one are true, and these are the, the uh, consecutive number is K, then the probability that my graph covers the configuration space is estimated by one, and is in the order of one minus one over K. If you take K uh, big enough, let's say, uh, 10 to the power 5 or 4, uh, then uh, your probability of coverage is good. And uh, uh, if you do not find uh, a path, there, there is good chance that there is not. So basically, you, you work like that. You, you generate a map with uh, the algorithm that I just uh, mentioned, which is your, your graph. And if you'd like to move from here to here, you connect your initial point and your final point, and you do a search in this graph. And then you improve this search with uh, some uh, computational geometry techniques, and at some point, you have something that you can smooth out, and this is your path. So this is the basics of probabilistic uh, roadmaps. Uh, sim simplified, there are a number of, of things to take into account, but at this level, this is uh, I believe sufficient for what I, I want to say. So uh, the diffusion method, instead of investing in a graph that may not be used many times, because this, this probabilistic map, if it is going to, to be used only once, you do not need the full coverage. Let's focus on a randomly generated tree toward the goal. So uh, uh, your tree, uh, I'm here, I would like to move here, and you, you, you start expanding your tree. At some point, you take a, a new configuration, whatever it is, for example here, you take the shortest node in the tree to this configuration, and, and then you, you, you take a configuration which is not in uh, the obstacles, and you keep moving like that uh, with uh, some hint uh, about how you reach the goal until you build up your tree. So this is an intuition of how uh, I it works, and a number, a number of things have been done by uh, several colleagues at last in particular uh, regarding these uh, algorithms. So uh, I'm not going to, to detail uh, the, the pseudocode. I believe you have had uh, uh, a good intuition of it. Here is an example that comes uh, from uh, LAS, and wa it was developed by uh, my colleague and friend Jean-Paul Lomo and uh, his co-workers, uh, Fi Philippe uh, also was uh, involved, and, and Florent. Uh, this is the HRP robot uh, that has to grasp uh, a ball here, and uh, the, 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 the idea is to let it plan for it, giving that the number of degrees of freedom that have been taken by the planner is over 30, 
uh, uh, for this case. So basically, uh, in this position, th the ball is not reachable. You ha you, the robot has to, to step back, and this is what uh, the, the planner uh, finds. It has to step ba back and uh, take the, the, the appropriate motions, including things that balance, such as putting uh, its uh, uh, left uh, arm in, in a position that allows to, to balance it and move the entire body until it reaches the, the, the ball. And uh, this uh, was developed in uh, the uh, early 2003, 2000, uh, th Philippe, what's the year? 2003. Other things, of course, with uh, humanoid robots in uh, Philips' team has been developed since then. I'm focusing here on just uh, the uh, motion planning uh, capabilities you see the robot do doing it. And the entire thing has been generated uh, automatically. Uh, there are a number of variants such as closed kinematics loops and uh, uh, another colleague from last Juan Cortes developed uh, planning techniques in, in order to take into account uh, things li like that where two, two robots are carrying together an object. A very interesting set of, of issues. So this, this was uh, motion planning. And in motion planning, you stay away from obstacles. Manipulation planning, you have to reach things and you have to reach your obstacles that are uh, the objects you would like to manipulate. So the problem is how to bring a movable object from start to goal position. And uh, uh, this may require regrasping. You have to seek appropriate contact with movable object. The issue is constrained motion and changing environment. If you say changing environment, it means that your roadmap keep changing if you use the same technique I just mentioned. So here is a generic uh, example that was developed by Thierry C. Simon, uh, Atlas and all other colleagues, where you see the number of motions in order to be able to make uh, this rod free uh, from the obstacles around it to uh, do the motion that uh, you, you just saw. So basically, the composite manipulation space is a space where you have a set of placement spaces uh, and a set of uh, grasp spaces. And the placement spaces are all the positions that the moving things, either uh, the robot or objects, can take. And the grasp space are where the uh, um, ob objects can be grasped uh, and in which position with respect to the robot. So you have to play with these two uh, spaces in order to do your manipulation playing. So passes in the manipulation uh, space are transit passes, where the robot moves alone, and transfer passes where the robot carries the movable object. And your plan is a sequence of transit and transfer passes, and the basic property is a reduction property that a pass in the connected uh, component of the two spaces CP and CG can be transformed into a finite sequence of transit transfer passes. This is the main property that allows to do the manipulation uh, from uh, these two spaces. So basically, you have a, a transfer pass, which is done with motion planning that I just presented, and you have transit pass, which is mul multiple motion planning queries in a changing environment because your environment changes bec because you are carrying the, the object. So th the entire problem that I just illustrated starts with the transit pass, then a pass in CP enter CG, which is a finite sequence of transit and transfer passes, another transit pass, uh, the, the, this is allows you to, to have the, the top of the, the rod uh, reachable. Uh, then an another uh, 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 finite sequence of transit and transfer passes, then a transfer pass, and uh, finally a transit pass in order to do the manipulation. So uh, uh, again, uh, an example that uh, is borrowed to from uh, the work of uh, Thierry Simon, where you see that this can be done with complex shapes and, uh, and uh, pl planning performs very well. Okay, so I covered here motion and manipulation planning in a, a, a very broad and, uh, and uh, 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 quick su survey. Let me tell you about how you model the integrated task and motion planning problems. So first, the question uh, is uh, how task planning is different from motion planning. What are the main differences in depth at the, at the um, uh, uh, representation and uh, mathematics of it. Often you hear that one is symbolic and the other is numeric. Task planning is symbolic, whereas motion planning is numeric. One is discrete, whether the other is continuous. This is what you hear, and 
probably you have seen that in many other problems, not only this one. In my view, it's not the good reason. In my view, the good reason is one is a relational space and the other one is a metric space. You can have a metric space that is discrete and you can have a numeric uh, space that is not metric. You can have a set of numbers for which you have no meaningful metric. The main problem is the problem of metric. A metric has to uh, meet the three axioms of metrics that you are aware of. Uh, you, you have the uh, sy symmetry and the triangular uh, inequalities and the usual metrics in Rn are the Manhattan matrix, the Euclidean matrix and their uh, generalizations. So in a relational space we have nothing like that. That's the main problem. In a metric space this really brings something. In a relational space what we have, we have a set of relations on the lattice of the power space, the set of, of subsets of S. You have set operations, or the equivalent if you, if you reduce that to, to logic, uh, uh, which, are, uh, in, which are conjunction, disjunctions, intersections, and you have a relational algebra. But it does not tell you how close is a state from another one. You have to rely on other things because you do not have a metric. So this is the main difference, and uh, I believe that this difference holds in other integrative problems. If you keep something out of this seminar, I believe this is the point I would like to insist on. So how do you model a temp domain? Well, uh, in motion manipulation planning, you only have movement actions, and you have implicit causality. You describe movement, and the causality is implicit. If you describe a movement, then uh, I have... Uh, I have triggered control that make made me move from one position to another one. Whereas in task planning, we rely only on the couple of preconditions, uh, ef causal effects. So action models for, for TAMP have to describe not only when and what, but also where, and this is a very important and often how, how, sorry, how, uh, in, in order to uh, be able to take into account the motion and, and manipulation uh, aspects. And... Um, you need movement models and you need movement and causal models. Many integrative approaches rely on this uh, set of models and do not add causal models and they cannot address uh, the, the kind of problems that I mentioned, such as, such as the fetch process and store problem. So basically your modeling is a triple where you have the environment properties of the world, the wall, the fixed obstacles, the shape and colors of objects and so on. You have the variable properties of the world, what are the poses and relations, and you have the descriptions of the act, wh what is active there, the robot or other actors that can move and act, uh, actuate the systems with their kinematics, dynami dynamics, and uh, feasible action models. So you can again rely on uh, parameterized state variables with finite set of parameterized variables as well as uh, with sets of other reals. For, for example, here the configuration uh, of our, our robot arm is mapping from time and uh, the, the arm into R to the 7. The poses are no longer into a set of discrete positions, but into R to the power 6 and, and so on. And you have also uh, the uh, uh, set of uh, discrete mappings uh, for the other state variables. So you, 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 you mix up all your state variables in, in some uniform way. Some of them are mapped into uh, continuous uh, domains and others into discrete domains like here. So you can partition your set of state variables on some of them are in the reals and some of them are in discrete sets and the reals you get uh, a metric in discrete sets you do not have a metric. So you partition your, your state space accordingly into part of it which is uh, the configuration space and part of it which is the r remaining set of state variables. And your state is a pair QS where this is the metric component and the which is the symbolic component. So basically the usual uh, motion planning is a search in Q, the usual task planning is search in S and the TAMP is the coupling. So basically I have to find a model which tells me how to predict if I am here what will be the outcome uh, of my actions, which is C prime. And I can compute that with two functions, phi and gamma, which gives me Q prime and gamma prime. So the problem of my predictive model is to come up with phi and gamma. And the point is that in motion planning, phi 
is a function of Q and A, but not S. In, in task planning, gamma is a function of S and A, but not Q. Here, I have added the coupling, and uh, this formulation shows where the coupling is, is because of my prediction takes into account uh, the other state variables that you have an integration problems. Here, represented in a simple form. So, how do I uh, solve time problems? Uh, do, do I have five minutes or ten minutes? Ten, thank you. So how do I solve time problems? I'm not giving you pseudocode here, but just a few intuitions about a set of uh, approaches uh, that I have organized into a map. We are working on a survey paper with a few colleagues I mentioned er er uh, later. And um, uh, these uh, this are the approaches that uh, the literature has worked on in order to organize the search space with these two components that I just uh, uh, mentioned. Let me uh, first tell you about the state of roadmap, uh, the space of roadmaps. In the space of roadmaps, uh, you start from the idea that a roadmap for motion planning refers to a unique couple environment robot. But every action but of transfer in free space, as I mentioned, changes the roadmap. Actions such as touch, grasp, hold, put, push, etc., affect both the environment and the robot. And then you have a, another roadmap. Okay. So let's start with a roadmap, do something within this roadmap, reach a point where we switch to another roadmap, and, and then another roadmap uh, from this point, and so on. So this is the idea of space of roadmap approaches. And I keep doing this with planning at different levels, uh, planning at uh, this co composition of roadmaps and planning within a, a, a roadmap in order to uh, reach my goal. So uh, this has been uh, addressed uh, quite early with uh, also work that was done uh, in uh, our lab uh, under the supervision of uh, my colleague Rashid Alami uh, with the planner Asimov, Cambon and uh, others has worked uh, uh, on that. Here, uh, the, the plan requires moving the red box and uh, a change of grasp between the two robots regarding the, the, the green box. And this was done by taking into account a collection of roadmaps and doing planning at the two levels, the task planning and, and the motion planning, uh, as, you, uh, as illustrated here. Uh, another complex uh, example I show you, only part of it is the uh, IKEA assembly uh, problem where uh, my colleagues have worked on how robots with different capabilities, one of them can glue things so the other one can assemble differently, can work together in order to assemble an IKEA table in simulation in this case. Uh, the planner has been tested in, in, in simpler cases in, uh, real w in, uh, with real robots, but here complex cases were in simulation. And uh, th there are a large collection, I don't remember how many uh, roadmaps that were taken into account in order to, to do that. You see that the, pl the, the plan they come up with, the, the, the Asimov come up with, is far from being optimal. The, the, the robot uh, keeps, keeps go going around in order to, to find the appropriate way to finish, I I'm showing you only part of, of the plan, to finish uh, this, uh, this, this task. But it also tells, uh, shows uh, how, how complex the, the problem I is. This, uh, mm, this planner um, uh, was uh, uh, really um, uh, brought really new, uh, interesting new things with uh, significant uh, f functionalities, uh, but uh, um, it is computationally demanding and it has a limited scal scalability uh, as, as, it, as it was. The uh, similar techniques was, uh, was uh, developed at uh, Stanford uh, with uh, Jose Latombe and, and others um, for uh, tasks like uh, this one. Here, uh, the uh, actions were only mo motion actions with uh, uh, complex ro robot uh, and, and uh, mo complex actions like this one. Tested in simulation, in my view, hi high, high computational cost, also scaling up is in, in clear. This is also using a space of, of roadmaps, moving through different roadmaps on the basis of motion planning uh, techniques. Uh, let me illustrate hierarchical, symbolic, and metric uh, techniques with a forward search uh, 
forward search approaches. So basically here, you rely on hierarchy, where at the higher level you consider only the abstract causal relations of your actions, and you refine it at the metric level, taking into account all its aspects. And you do a forward, a forward search in your state space with backtracking, and all the problem is to perform intelligent backtracking in order to compute all the, uh, all the metric parameters uh, that are within here, taking into account where you'd like to, to, to go and your goals. And this has been tested in simulation. This, was, uh, this work was done by uh, Garrett and all at MIT. Um, th this is a limited planner. This is a more uh, interesting one for tasks such as how to sort this object between uh, red and green for these two tables, or how to take this object from here to here, uh, given that there is a door and you have to open the, the door with a switch. So you have to do some uh, task planning as well as some uh, motion planning. For example, uh, in this case, 25 actions in about 1.5 minutes uh, to, to uh, find out the plan. Uh, similar uh, things was developed for uh, 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 two dual arm ma manipulation uh, by colleagues from Sweden, uh, from Orbo, moving and inverting the pause of a cup with pick regrasp and place uh, actions. Uh, they, they, they tackled more complex problems with similar ca capabilities. Uh, this is an interesting uh, work, more recent, uh, also at last, by uh, Garbi, Lalma, Ra Ra Rashid, and other colleagues from, uh, 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 from uh, LAS about uh, the c composition of two planners, uh, one which is hierarchical task planner that take can take into account the plan of a human uh, partner of the robot and GTP with his uh, geometric uh, ta task planner. Uh, that takes into account motion manipulation, pick place, and, and handover. And the, the idea is to have this, uh, this hierarchical decomposition I, I mentioned with basically the, the, the main problem is to do intelligent backtracking, taking into account that the geometrical part and the motion part can inform about where to pla place the object successfully. Um, it has been tested in uh, things such as uh, multi-agent task with where, where a robot has to uh, collaborate with two humans in order to satisfy a customer a demand by someone here uh, with tasks such as taking object, making as, uh, p painting them, and uh, um, or asking someone to, 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 to paint part of the object and ach achieving the work jointly with two uh, persons. So uh, my last illustration is uh, hierarchical uh, symbolic metric with goal regression search. So basically here, uh, you, you do goal regression, you start from the goal and you go back uh, to uh, your current position over hierarchy of, of uh, um, state variables are fluent and you start from the goal and this is your the, the desired state. And from this desired state, you, you have something uh, that uh, this was developed by uh, Leslie Cabling and others at MIT. You, you have a way to find out what are the possible configurations that uh, this uh, uh, requirement for your goals uh, lead to. And you have a, a set of possible configurations that you have computed that may or may not work. And from that, you do uh, uh, regression, which tells you what are the conditions that allow you to perform this action A from here to here. And this allow you to compute a set of, of states from which you do uh, something that was developed year, uh, way, ways back by Thomas Lozano Perez, pre-image back chaining, back chaining, which re reflects to what are the previous configurations that can lead to this one. And you keep doing this until you reach your current state. And your current state, you know the current configurations. And from this, you go back in the other way until uh, you solve the problem. Sorry, I went too fast. So when you have done all this regression, you know your configuration, and then you project it, and you, you, you have solved the problem. But this may or may not work because these suggestions may miss a number of configurations that allow the plan to be feasible. Anyway, colleagues at uh, MIT have been able uh, to do things such as the fetch, process, and store problem with taking objects, doing uh, some processing uh, on them, and putting them somewhere. Uh, a very comprehensive approach. Um, it requires a lot of uh, a priori knowledge in the models that are needed. So my conclusion is that 
uh, here we have metric space versus relational space, and both are essential in most heterogeneous tasks, in particular in the integration that I mentioned. Approaches to task and motion planning illustrate how to tackle this integration of the two spaces uh, with a uh, few illustrations that I mentioned. Uh, the research in task and motion planning is still facing a number of uh, uh, challenges, such as preci precise comparison of existing approach, uh, benchmark I already uh, mentioned, and a mapping between uh, the specific problems and specific approaches. Uh, you have to keep in mind that task and motion planning is not the sum of the part. The sum of the part gives you the only the, uh, the part. I decoupling doesn't work most often unless you have a, a very easy problem because of uh, the, this uh, precise phenomenon that I underlined. Uh, metric reasoning for acting is significantly more complex than motion planning in free, in free space. And you have to take it into account and from a computational viewpoint, motion planning is more computationally expensive than task planning. Most often you end up doing in the, the approach that I mentioned 10 times more time spent 10 times more in motion planning and manipulation planning than in task planning. And uh, the critical bottleneck is here. Sampling techniques are only probability complete. If you do not find a solution, you may need to uh, refine further, uh, uh, um, take more random samples in your space and you have to do a cutoff at, at some point that, that uh, does not tell you whether there is no solution or you have not been doing enough effort to find it. Uh, sampling and grease-based techniques, uh, y y they require managing progressive refinement because uh, exactly of what I said, as soon as you sample, uh, when you sample, you, you don't know unless you find a solution that your sampling is enough and you may need to, to go back and sample further. I proposed a, a taxonomy of, of problems and I'm not able at this point to give you a mapping between problems and approaches. I believe that more work in the literature is needed to find this, ta this uh, mapping. And uh, uh, finally, uh, the uh, deterministic approaches that I surveyed, most ap approaches that I surveyed are deterministic, are often insufficient. You have to take into account probabilities and uncertainty. And uh, you have to, to, uh, to take into account the integration of planning and axing that I didn't mention at all. And I believe that uh, a number of ideas can be extended to other problems involving metric and non-metric relational spaces. And I'll finish by uh, acknowledging the contribution of uh, my uh, colleagues uh, at LAS, uh, with wi whom we are preparing a survey paper about uh, these issues. And thank you. Thank you very much, Malik, for this fascinating uh, talk. I'm sure there are many questions. Yes, Gregory. In English, I'd like to have your uh, opinion about the integration of uh, reinforcement learning in this kind of uh, subject. Yeah, uh, uh, unexpected question, and thank you. <laughs> so, learning and planning. Briefly and summary. Of, of course, I was expecting the, this question because it's the first question that comes to mind. The, the bottleneck of all model-based approach is, give me the model, how to acquire the model. This is the bottleneck. This we have been facing this bottleneck in planning for 30 years, and uh, it's still there. So there are a number of sub-problems to this one. Learning environment models. Well advanced. We know how to do that. Learning uh, sensory motor skills. Also quite advanced. Uh, good, good results. Learning control strategy. We developed a number of things. Uh, for that in, 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 in ATLAS, learning behavior models. This is also something we developed at, uh, uh, with uh, di di different te te techniques. Uh, sensory motor skills, if you demonstrate uh, the, the skill in the, in the uh, physical model of the robot, it's very quite easy. This was done by Jan Peters and his colleagues, and after a while you do reinforcement learning and you, you solve the problem. This is harder. Learning motion generation procedures. This and is hard. This is the chair in NIT of, uh, of Nicolas Mansart. Uh, learning task decomposition models and learning causal models is also something that's quite open. We have a number of results. And my, my own belief is that uh, the, the approach here relies on simulation, 
models. This is Ni Ni Nicola Mansart approaches, uh, uh, simulations, models, and uh, generative neural ne networks in order to, to learn these generation procedures. Here, my own uh, intuition and interest is to put together interaction, human-robot interaction, in order to demonstrate the task, not in this way, but how I do it myself in my own configuration space and leave the robot, figure out, and do reinforcement in order to learn. Th this is a very ambitious agenda, and I hope that in particular within Toulouse we will progress in, the, in this agenda. So I don't know if I have answered, but this is my a priori about learning. A number of things are, let's say, quite advanced, and others are less advanced. Thank you. Another question? Yes, Eve. What do you think is applicable to perception problems? I was thinking about uh, vision, um, uh, vision to model building, mm -hmm. like uh, localization, detection and localization, mm -hmm. uh, plus understanding relationship, like um, answering queries about images. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, is this object uh, in front of other object? Uh, mm -hmm. is, uh, is an object of such type, of such color, or uh, near to another one? Or all the geometrical and, and yeah. uh, physical relation that can be inferred from uh, images. Yeah. So, uh, th there is a, a wide set of, of uh, uh, work on uh, planning and perception perception for, for uh, planning for perception. Um, we, we wrote a survey paper with a colleague, uh, with Felix Ingra, that I mentioned just er early, earlier with, uh, with Felix. We wrote a survey paper where we cover some of these issues. And uh, some of these uh, issues are related to, um, in a dynamic, uh, in a, in a dynamic uh, setting of your problem, I do not have a full model of the world, but I have to move out to take more information in order to answer the queries. And the issue uh, is, how do I plan uh, this task? H where, which sensor should I use? Where should I put it? And also, how should I process the information uh, I, I have? Uh, th there are uh, uh, work about sensor placement problems, uh, work about uh, modality pro pro processing, uh, which modalities of sensor to, to use. We, ha we have been working on quite old project about that, but things have, uh, uh, have progressed since uh, then. Uh, in order to answer part of uh, the, the issues that, that uh, you, you mentioned, in a dynamic setting where you move your sensors and you uh, uh, act, uh, act in the environment in order to answer the queries. I don't know if I understand uh, correctly and, uh, and res uh, responded correctly to your questions, but the field is quite active. Okay, this, okay, this is quite interesting. A, a, a simpler question when you have an existing image. Yeah. If you are able to, um, how you are able to mix um, relations and a metric uh, from, uh, from the image uh, Itself. So for the purpose of the modeling the, the object, or for, for the purpose yeah, of, of what? modeling what you see, uh, how to mix the, the the two domain that you have mentioned of symbolic and and numeric, mm -hmm. uh, because they are uh, present in the in yeah. images. In so what we want to learn from images. <coughs> so I if I have, for example, a generic model of a, of a chair. Again, something we have worked on in, 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 in the past, and I have a, a single image. I'm not allowed to move around the chair and so on. How can I model further from the collection of pixels that gives this? Is that your, your problem? Yes, there, there is a number of work abo about this, but it's not really a planning problem. It's a, pro a reconstruction problem. If, uh, 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 Simon, si yes, would, would you like to complete because uh, you, you have worked on that? Yes, ah. <laughs> I thought that you, you wanted to complete because you have worked on these reconstruction okay. issues. You, you have so, so you have casted the planning problem in four types, yeah. action, motion, 
perception and communication. Yeah. And you only spoke about the first two, so yeah. you made half of the job. Yes, only. yes, yes. Uh, a quick comment first. Uh, perception and communication may be seen as the same thing, which yeah. is information gathering. Yeah. Just a, a parenthesis. Now, from your point of view, how are you going to model the whole planning system that incorporates these four kind of planning? What about, so the, is the perception or information space a metric one or not? Uh, can you do the modeling pursuing your Cartesian products of spaces? Yeah, the, the perception space is metric, okay. but it, it yes, it, it, it is it is a, a metric space that's quite different from motion and, and manipulation. Um, on the one hand, you have all the probabilities. On the other hand, this metric is mediated by the model of the sensors. It's an information space. Yes, but it is different from communication because in communication you have to take into account interaction. Whereas perception, you just query the, the external world. You query the external world, and if you are allowed to query, to keep querying it by acquiring more information, moving, putting your sensors, and, and so on, you end up with a planning problem. But it is a different metric. It is definitely a metric, uh, but it is, a, a, in my view, a, a different metric, but you still have uh, the help of metrics with a lot of uncertainty and probabilities and uh, with uh, the uh, intermediation of the model of your sensors that are in between and you have to rely on the models of sensors to do the planning but it, it is very difficult problems of of integrating the the, the four uh, i know a bit of work about integration of task and communication planning a bit of work of integrating task and perception planning but motion and visual serving i mentioned uh, that and on, on top of it but i i know no single paper that tackles the four research agenda <laughs> for our next perspective. Um, yeah. So planning requires to know the model. Yeah. So of course you're learning on a simulator. Yeah. Uh, how is it difficult to transfer it to a real world uh, robot, for example? I mean, the physics of the model may differ even a little bit, right? Not, not yeah. sure I understand. So I, I have a model yeah, of, a of, of the environment and this model of the environment uh, you would like to, tra to transfer it to a yeah, robot? I mean the, the simulator uh, ah, model the simulator. is different of the real world yeah. Uh, model. Yeah. So once you found a plan on, uh, on the simulator, is it easy to transfer it to a real world robot, for yeah. example? Yes, the, the, the this is uh, in indeed um, a tough question. It's not a matter of simulation only. Yeah. It's um, a, a, a matter of um, the models in general. And uh, the, the problem is that between the plans and, and, uh, the, uh, and uh, the, 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 the goal being rich, you have acting. And you have to integrate acting with planning. And uh, this is another integration that I mentioned briefly but didn't tackle, but it's uh, really uh, in my field of interest. I mentioned a book about, about that. Because when you act, you, you take into account the feedback from the real world. And you take into account the, uh, the uh, discrepancies between your models and the real world. And uh, you have to uh, define another classes of models for your actions. I, I mentioned what, when, where, but you also have to say how. And the how should be robust enough yeah. to allow you for, uh, to make these differences. In, in some for, for, for example, in some cases, you have to repeat the action a number of times because the probability of g getting there is so and so. Uh, but if you repeat it, you, you have a, a very good probability of, of, of doing it. This is what we, you, we, we do, you and me. And we, we have uh, models of how to perform and how is acting. And you have to reason on that as well as on the plan. I think that... Um, the integration of planning and, and acting is a very important and tough issue, and uh, I'd love to discuss further with you uh, about it, uh, if you want. I, I can make another talk about that at some other point. Okay, Alexandra. Uh, thanks for the talk. I, I wanted to dig a little more into uh, Simon's question. Uh -huh. um, when you talk about communication planning, yeah. are you talking about searching into epistemic space? Yeah. So. This doesn't appear only for multi-agent planning. I, yeah. It's also for a single agent. Can you tell us uh, an example of such an application? It's just so, uh, basically, uh, 
we call an epistemic action is an action that gives me knowledge. This is by definition what's uh, an epistemic action. So planning with epistemic actions is planning to get information. This is what Simon mentioned. So um, a, a plan with epistemic planning capabilities is, is I, I didn't illustrate any, uh, any kind of these plans because uh, was outside of the scope of this uh, presentation, uh, but uh, I can refer you to a few planners where you can have epistemic actions. Acquiring information is part of the capabilities of the planner that reasons on what is missing and which actions can give me this knowledge. So this can work for uh, single agent as well as for multi-agent planner, and the planners that I have in mind are only a single agent planner. Unless you think of some other one, uh, Arthur? Yeah. So epistemic action are really part of the pl planning problems as well as you'd like to get information from the world. Thank you. Thank you.